welcome you. This is Rock City Church Thursday night teaching. And uh, we do this uh, because we love the Word and we're hungry for more of God's Word. And the game plan is, is that you get a revelation of who He is and what He's done for you and how He's provided for you and how He's made a way for you. Once you get that revelation and you know what He's done for you and what He's doing in you, it changes the way you live.
Creation, we declare the glory, the faith, the wonders of our God tonight. Hallelujah! Oh, that men would praise his name, would praise his name to the ends of the earth. Oh, that men would praise his name, would praise his name to the ends of the Come on! Oh, that men would praise his yeah. name.
you to turn to a neighbor and declare it. Come on. No more shackles, no more chains, no more pundit, I am free. Yeah. Come on now, turn to somebody else and say it. No more shackles. No more shackles, no more chains, no more pundit, I am free. Shackles, no 
Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Father, we bless you. We thank you for tonight. Open our hearts, open our heads. And God, we thank you for what you're about to do right now, what you've already done. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Look at somebody and say, hey, I like you. God bless you. Welcome to Rock City Church Live in Baltimore. We're glad you joined us tonight. This is our Thursday night service where we teach the Word. Come along with us, and we're going to get deep into the Word, and we're uh, really on a good subject here we're talking about. So join us, and at any time, if you want a prayer, there's a prayer line open for you. Just call in. Somebody's ready to pray for you. And also, at any time, you can give. And be generous. Do that. Give to the kingdom. It's in time when we really need to see the kingdom flourish. And that happens because God's people are generous. and God's people give. And then the kingdom flourishes. So amen. God bless you. We're glad you joined us. Amen. Rock City Church, you alive? Yeah. All right. And a um, couple of good things we want to remind you. Saturday uh, is a um, uh, work day. We postponed the one we had set up before to clean up outside and get it ready for spring. And uh, this Saturday is that date. And uh, we need you to come if you signed up especially. If you haven't signed up, I think they have a table back there, somebody to sign up. And you can just go back there and say, I'm going to come. And that's a spring cleanup, 8 o'clock now. Bring gloves, wear some shoes that are, you know, solid uh, type, you know, boots type things. Don't wear uh, those little flimsy little flip, uh, you know, little f uh, small, uh, those little sliders my wife wears a lot of times. No, those little sliders. No, those little shoes, those little ones that got no substance to them anyway. Uh, wear something you can go outside with and walk around inside. Plus there's things on the ground sometimes from construction. We don't want you to get hurt. And uh, please be there. Please be on time. And uh, we can get this done. It takes us one, one time in the spring and one time in the fall. And uh, that's how we get it to look so nice. And um, uh, we appreciate you all helping. And uh, how many of you think uh, Sunday went well? Yeah. Was good day. Good day. Play was done well. Everybody did a good time. A good, uh, did their part really well. And uh, what is that picture on the screen? Oh, that's just some of the things. And um, but we need to understand that you know we we've never had a problem gathering people. We just have to work hard on uh, helping them find a home. Hello, and that takes that takes follow up, and uh, that's where we're at with this. And so it's real important to uh, uh, make the effort. Get, a, get on a team that you can help in the zones and different areas that you could help and uh, making a phone call, one or two calls, whatever it takes, just to reach out to people and say, hey, glad you came. Just like the FBI does. If somebody is not reached in 28, uh, 48 hours, uh, they say that you're probably not going to get them. If you don't get them back in 48 hours, you're probably not getting them. So we were raised that way. In my church in Virginia Beach, we had... At one time, we had 30-some pastors, and we managed to go right after people. I mean, as soon as they came in on Sunday, uh, there's a church I go to. It haven't been in a while, but I used to go to in Singapore, and uh, a lady named uh, Dow uh, Dowdy. And uh, she um, did the most amazing thing. She had a building beside her sanctuary, and she had a large crowd. And she took me over there right after service. She said, watch, I'm going to show you something. So we went over and crossed the street and went over to this building. And they had cubicles like you do for a business center. And there were people on the phone. By the time I finished, there was probably 100 people in that room. And every one of them was buzzing. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah, you know. They were all talking because they immediately went after the people when they came in. And because of it, they retained a lot of people, and the church grew really rapid and grew to be very large. And Dominique, take, uh, the pastor, his name is Dominique now, and he's doing the same thing. But just encourage you, you know, find a way to get on a team, find a way to get involved so that you can help follow up with these people that come in. I mean, if you understand that. 
And there's ways. There's ways. And uh, we don't like to give birth to babies and leave them on the corner. Hello? Uh, and really, the worst thing that happens, this is true now, when you lead somebody to Christ and you abandon them, you open up a spiritual portal that they've never had open before. And so the enemy comes in and sows some demonic thing and confusion or something in there because that portal of spirituality is open. And we have to be the ones there to say, hey, it's about Jesus. Amen. It's not about that, this, and that. It's about the Lord. Come on. And so I urge you, urge you to do that, okay? Get involved. And um, then we have Tuesday nights and, and Saturday nights, but Tuesday night is our work night uh, up at uh, CP2, Campus 2, and we are getting there. They're going to start school there on the 8th, I think, 8th, yeah, yeah. And it looks really nice in there, and they're really getting it. I mean, it's really nice. The new doors came in. The last load of doors came in, and they're installing them. And so um, we're, we're chasing the workers out of the building, and that's what you want to do. If you wait till it's done, it's never done. Remodeling is horrible. Remodeling is the worst thing in the world. I'll build 50 buildings before I would offer to uh, remodel one. Because you're, you're fixing somebody else's mistakes. You're fixing things that you can't see that are broke behind what you think is, is there. Uh, like this, when we built this, I know where every single steel piece, everything that's in the concrete, everything that's in everything. And so if something breaks, I know right where it is. Uh, and it's really a, a challenge when you're doing this. And we've done a remarkable job. And many of you that have helped, we really appreciate you, Brian uh, Willison has been in there. I think he spent the night in there. Pam will tell me if he did, but uh, he's been in there day and night because he works there in the daytime, and then he comes back and spends time at nights and Tuesday nights and different times Saturday. And there's guys like that that are really pushing to get this done and get the school done and get uh, the uh, Bible school ready, and uh, they have an open house on uh, Friday night, so... Uh, uh, I guess they want you to go to that. I, I don't, I don't see anything about it. But anyway, they have a open house, and if you're interested in the Bible school, you could go there. You could check it out. It's at seven o'clock, and um, they've got uh, some new students that are lined up, and about 15, I think, that are going to look at it. And um, but if you're interested, take a peek. It might be for you. Uh, we don't want people to go there that are studying the Bible. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, uh, but we don't want people there to study the Bible. Study your Bible at home and come to, to a Bible school to be equipped. There's a difference. Everybody should read their Bible, study their Bible, but if you really get a, go in there to get equipped, you're going in there to get equipped for some purpose, and that's really what this is about. We're changing the name. We're working on some things that will turn this into uh, a college at some point. Not a university, of course, but we will, we will see it go towards a college at some point. We're working on the privatization part and, uh, I mean, credited part, I'm sorry. And, um, but uh, we've got a good board now, and we're doing some things with the uh, materials that we put out there, how we put it out there and get a brand change, name, that kind of thing, so we can really have an impact. So um, it's, a, it's a great school. There's rare schools like this. There are not many of them, and uh, not many that are gap schools that are for uh, uh, Christians. Gap schools have been going on quite a while. It took a spike during uh, COVID, and a gap school is exactly what it says. It fills in a gap, and it's between high school and college, and that's for people who uh, are, are serious you know, about doing something in their life, but they just don't know what it is. And they go to, we send them to colleges like blank tapes. And then those colleges that are perverted and twisted, ideology is all they care about, they twist that thing. And the next thing you know, that kid you sent there is not the same kid. And so Gap School gives them a chance to come out of high school, be in a college setting, uh, but at the same time get focused on what the Lord wants for their life. 
And we're looking at the word called discovery. So you discover God and who he is. Then you discover who you are. And then you discover what he wants for your life. And in that process, the gap school works for you coming out of high school. But it also works for those who went to college and they get out of college and they never do what they went to college for. Spend sixty, hundred, fifty, two hundred thousand dollars for college, and you're doing, you know, you're working at McDonald's or something. And so this is the other side of the gap. So you get out of college and you go, what the heck am I doing? Well, that's what you're going to do. Go to the gap school, and get really solidly committed to the lordship of Christ, and then He'll define for you what your purpose is. And once you put your purpose in this thing, everything changes. So I encourage you to check it out, look at it, think about it, and especially parents with kids. Uh, I'm pleased to see some parents are putting their kids in there uh, that this coming uh, uh, September, so that's a good thing. Um, and uh, we've got a bunch of hirings trying to do, and uh, that's really important. And uh, we're trying to hire some uh, different people for different positions, and it's uh, everything from... Um, uh, let me make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah. Uh, it's everything from secretarial, administrative types uh, down to uh, truck driver, delivery drivers for food. Uh, Martha's Kitchen needs cooks and uh, all kinds of people like that. We have uh, receptionists that we need. We just need a block of people who say, well, I think I'm going to go work for the church. And uh, what a great environment, what a great opportunity. And uh, it's, uh, I've been working for the church for uh, oh, 40, 48 years, 46, that's something. And uh, I don't have any regret. And uh, I, I love it. And it's a, a great environment. It's a great opportunity for you to be around what God's doing. And what we're doing right now with the reentry, what we're doing with the uh, Bible school, what we're doing with the school, and all of those things on top of what we do as a church, um, there's a lot of opportunity. So check it out, and uh, we'd like to hire people that are from the church, and that's really important. Uh, we don't want to get down to the place where we just have to hire somebody who's not saved and not in the church. That makes it very challenging, amen? So think about it, look at it. If you have some kind of gift and talent in those areas, uh, at least come talk to somebody, get an application, see what it looks like. You never know. Amen? And uh, uh, also uh, boom, 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 uh, classes, Bible school classes, speaking about the Bible school. Uh, Elder Mark is going to be teaching this week <laughs> biblical economics. And uh, y'all are clapping and you don't even know what, they, what he's going to teach. It's, you're kind of like robots, man. You know, you, He's, he's, he's gonna, you don't even know what he's, I mean, come on. Uh, now, my wife's going to be teaching the following week. Now you, man, we've taught you all this stuff and you still ain't learned nothing. Yeah, go on. When the pastor's wife, the bishop's wife is involved, you clap even if you ain't been there. Help them, Jesus. All right. And, uh. And we have men's breakfast, lastly, uh, coming up on the 13th, I think it is. And uh, we have tickets. If you haven't got your ticket, guys, get some tickets. I got two tickets right here. If you want to come, I'll give them to you. Who's here? Wants to come to the uh, men's breakfast. All right. <laughs> Man, there's something in that seat. Like shot them right up in the air. Jeez. Lord. As long as it's free, man, these guys will eat any time. <laughs> They're ready to eat all the time. Help them, Jesus. Amen. Well, let's get in the Word tonight, and we're going to pick back up on the subject of passion and uh, what, we, um, what we started last week um, before going into Resurrection Sunday was the week of what they call the passion, passion of Christ. And so I looked at it from a little bit of different angle, not just what Jesus went through in suffering, which is very, very important, but I looked at it from a standpoint, what was, what was the passion 
in his heart? What was his heart passionate about? And what was the father's heart passionate about? And I've pulled out a couple of pieces that I think will define that. And uh, so let me just do a little review and then we'll get into tonight. And um, John 17, verse 26, uh, is the priestly prayer. He says, I have declared to them your name. Okay, that's a starting point. Jesus saying this, he said, I have declared to them, us, the disciples, uh, your name. And God's name, when, whenever you hear it like that, it's really kind of amazing because his name uh, means so much. Oh, my gosh, his name is so vast. And I've declared your name uh, to them. And, and he says, then he says the second thing, I will declare it. And that means that he already has and he will continue to. That means two things. You could look at it from this level. He did to the early disciples and he will to us. Have you hear that? And then the third thing, he declared uh, this, that the love that with which you, um, come on, please roll it, loved me, uh, may be in them. And, and he's talking about, now that he's told him his name, he's told him, uh, you know, I, I'll declare it to him. And, and then he says uh, that the love that with which you loved me may be in them. He was really showing us how passionate Jesus was. He wanted to show the Father's love. No greater love, we saw it in the play, than a man lay down his life. No greater love than a father give up his son. And, and so we see that. And he says, fourthly, and then I in them. So he's not only want to see the Father's love in uh, them, but he said he wants to see him, himself, Jesus, in them. He wants to be in us. We need Christ in us, the hope of glory. And uh, we're living in battles t today, no doubt about it. There are battles going everywhere around the world. Every time you turn around, there's a new battle of some level. And uh, we're living in the midst of battles like never before. And in these last days, we're going to see even more. Jesus warned us. The spirit of, the, of this world is continually raging against the church of Jesus Christ to wear down the saints, Daniel 7, 25, to wear out. It's also in the book of Revelation that Satan's role is to wear out the saints. And, and it really just you know, kind of ticks me off when I hear Christians complaining, oh my God, I'm busy. And, and then, you know, they were busy in the world, but they didn't complain. They just smothered it with booze or something else. And, and now you get all the benefits of work for the kingdom and in the kingdom. Sound just went off, whatever that means, guys. And uh, so the kingdom of God is constantly under attack and, and you, you get to be a part of advancing the kingdom. And uh, it's not the work of the kingdom that wears you down. It's Satan that wears you down. And what he does, he, he gets you to look at yourself, your flesh, your, your own selfishness. And as he does that, he wears you down because he's comparing things. He's comparing your life with this or that. And all of a sudden, you begin to look at that and you get weary looking that way. Let me tell you, when you get on that beltway, if you stay looking in your rearview mirror, your neck's going to be tired. Yes. Peeking through that little teeny lens, that's what a lot of people do. And uh, so we need to understand that Satan's role is to wear down the saints. And this is a week that we prefer to just the passion of Christ. We just went through it, and there was a war. And the, the, this war against the church, God's people, is a clash of passions. The passion of this world is at war with the passion of God. And I'm going to define some things that I see uh, about the passion of God. And uh, uh, Revelation 3.14, the church of Lesodians, uh, church age, lukewarmness, is the warning declared and, the, uh, and passion for the Son of God is the remedy that they prescribe. And uh, he said, you know, I see you. I see that you're neither hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. How many of you know lukewarm is not passionate? And uh, people that aren't passionate, and I'm going to say this, that this word passion is important because 
uh, anybody that's not passionate, you're, you're apathetic, you're, you're, you're very placid, you're very, you know, compromised, and you're not, you're not aggressively advancing the kingdom. You're, you're just kind of going along. You're lazy. Hello? It's true. Passionate people get up in the morning uh, and they're already, you know, predicting in their mind the good and things that are going to happen and what they're going to do. How many of you have been reading that declaration? Well, if you read it, you better believe it. If you're just reading it to go through it and not believing it, it'll never work for you. You have to read it and believe it and then you have to act on it. And, and it's that kind of approach. I never get up, ever, without a confident understanding of what I'm doing, why I'm up, and what's my purpose. I don't ever get out of bed without knowing that. Because when I go to bed, I sit down and write the top 10 things I'm going to do today. And, and then if I don't accomplish all 10, I push them over to the next day. Because I set my life in living deliberately. I don't live accidentally. I don't wait for the life of, the, of God to just evolve for me. I'm deliberate about what I do. How do you hear that? And deliberate people are successful people. Hello? And we, we need to see that. And uh, every, you know, I hear people, I want to be successful. Well, if you do, then you have to be passionate. Because just look at every baseball, football, basketball, go to sports, go to any level of, uh, of, of sports, go to uh, anybody academically that's wanted to exceed uh, and get into some medical career, or anybody that's wanted to do any of those kind of things, they have to be passionate about what they do. It's the lukewarm, just kind of get along people that are always followers, they're never leaders. And that's people that don't see. There's some people that don't see anything around them. They're just seeing the moment of what they think is in front of them, and they're not even absorbing the opportunities that are there every single day. Let's look at the word passion. What comes to mind there? Romance, intimacy. Some of those are first thoughts that uh, might come to your mind, and it's true. Okay, that's important in marriage. If you don't have passion in marriage, that marriage ain't going to last. Hello, and all the, all the Christian teachers that teach on marriage, uh, uh, for years, a lot of them taught about how to, you know, act and, and how to say things correct and how to do all these things, and they never addressed passion. Almost like it was unholy to talk about passion. <laughs> and because we don't talk about it, it turns into something unholy because we don't hear what holiness is connected to passion. It's like teenagers, don't, don't escape teaching them about sex and about passion and about all that because if you don't, the world's going to teach them, but they're going to teach it from a twisted position. Passion can mean the emotions uh, as distinguished from reason, intense, driving, or overmastering, feeling, ardent affections. I mean, there's a number of dis definitions. A strong liking for a devotion to some activity, object, or concept. Webster no says it this way. How, and, and Webster noticed how it starts. The sufferings of Christ between the uh, night of the Last Supper and his death. Uh, and based on the uh, gospel narrative of the passion. And, and that's amazing that Webster's uh, chose 1864, I think it is, 18-something. Uh, they chose to, Webster's chose to use that definition. Webster's was a born-again believer, by the way, if you didn't know that. And, and they chose to use <clears throat> the passion of Christ as, as the emphasis of that passion. And have you know, Hebrews tells us, with joy set before him, he endured the cross. So we see the passion of Christ displayed on TV, you know, him carrying, him getting whipped and beaten, his face all disfigured and all of that. But, but the thing is, the writers of that missed the moment. Because Hebrews came back and said, with joy set before him, he endured the cross. Right. And, and if they would put a narrative in there, even in the pain of that, he had joy for what he was doing. It would bring truth to the narrative. 
Are you listening? And passion relates to our relationship with God and to his relationship with us. Think of John uh, at the supper. And remember I mentioned to you about leaning on the breast of Jesus, uh, listening to his heart. What was he trying to gather at that moment? What was he trying to get? Uh, he was being affectionate to, to Christ, of course. And uh, Jesus had said, I'm leaving. And they were kind of disturbed and all that's going on. But think about what would be on the heart of Jesus. What was, what, he's, he's a week away from dying. And he knows that, that after this meal, it's going to get tough. And he knew this. You understand? And, and yet, boy. He had, a, he had a joy to do this. Have you ever wondered what causes the heart of the Lord to beat a little faster, what makes the flicker of love to burn brighter in his heart? If someone was to mention the poor, the needy, his heart would pound. He would look at a city and weep. Uh, notice something. Jesus didn't weep over a lot of things. But when he looked over a city, he saw them as a sheep, as, he saw them as sheep, without a shepherd. And, and that means that that's a burden that he had. That, that's something he was carrying. Can you get that? And, oh, you got to hear, uh, to hear the heart of God and embrace the passions of the Son of God uh, would like be, like be like medicine to the church of this age, which needs to hear what is his heart. And what sacred cause awakens a man from the slumber of indifference to pursue the scent of the impossible? And this strange phenomenon is called passion. Passion is the fire of life and the energy of the soul. It is the wind that gives lift to the eagle. It is the fire that warms the heart in the midst of the coldness of culture set adrift. It is a man's friend in the dark hours of the night when others abandon him. It is the inner support that keeps him awake in the night season when others are fast asleep. It is the power for the race, the propulsion for the jet, the spark for the fire, and the wind for the sail, the contractions for the birth. I don't know if you've ever noticed. I'm not going to do it tonight, but I, I will do it soon. Uh, have you ever noticed you'll wake up around 3 o'clock? There's a biblical reason for that, and it's really important to understand. Uh, I can be away from three to five many, 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 many days, and in my, in my prayer and thought life of being still and listening to the Lord, I gain so many things and much insight. When I wake up, I'm not anxious. Uh, I, when I get up, I mean, when I, I'm not anxious, I already have an understanding of things that maybe were perplexing for the day or the week, and yet because I listen to the Lord at 3 in the morning, uh, it just happened last night, I, I get up at 3 and, and I'm totally awake and, and I don't have any anxiety and I'm not, oh, I got to get sleep. I got to go back to sleep. I got to go to sleep. And you... You lay there in bed and you tie your pajamas in a pretzel and then, you know, rolling over and over and over until you can't figure out what end of the bed you're supposed to be at. Stop being rebellious and get up. Every successful man and woman has experienced a transfer of power of passion. Like a silent hunter, the unseen force captured them with its reality and catapults them into the race of the inaccessible. These men and women become its prisoners, coerced by the allurement of its dream. This kind of success demands that a man reach deep down within himself for an inner strength that can be produced only by a passionate zeal. And then this is uh, one more, and then I'm going to be where I was uh, last Thursday. Uh, the contented are disturbed by their zeal and their favor, uh, fervor. Uh, people who are content. People that just try to get along, try to get through, try to get by with, try to not rock boats, never confront anything, just contending to get by. I can tell you those people are storing up frustrations that usually send them off to a tangent 
all of a sudden because they had no relief valve that allowed the pressure to go on a regular basis. Are you listening? They explode because there was no teapot, kettle. Many isolate them from the, uh, from them. Those kind of people, people that are the contented people are disturbed by people who've got zeal, people that really are on fire for God, want more of God. They bother people. Lukewarm people are bothered by them. They can't stand it. And, and I mean, I told you all the story the other night. I, I mean, in 1974, I had two prophets, David Shock and Charles Green. I never had presbytery before. And they prophesied that that was going to happen to me, that people were going to be disarmed and people were going to have a hard time figuring out because the zeal of God was going to be so on me, in me, that it would cause them to be uncomfortable in their lukewarmness, saith the Lord. You know, what do you do with that? And, um, and many isolate them, uh, themselves for a fear of catching this horrible disease. Uh, the challenge is one to move outside the comfort, the tradi- traditional and the conventional. Uh, they, they, people like that will, will run from people who look at, let's do a play and be out every night for a couple of weeks. Oh, my God. I mean, they run from people like that like it is a plague. You must have a disease. (laughs) Not every passion is legitimate. Some passions are destructive and even dangerous. And people have those passions too. A drive for wealth, fame, power can motivate people to betrayal. Uh, Absalom was that way. Uh, Judas was that way. The guards that guarded the tomb were that way. People who are after power and after money, they end up portraying everything, their own morals, their own standard, and families, and everything else around them. They portray these things because they're driven for that power. They want that power. And um, uh, I I get power. It's called deutimus. I got it the day I got the Holy Ghost. Uh, A drive for wealth, fame, and power can motivate people to betrayal. It can possess them to the point where they manipulate those around them and destroy their own souls. In spite of the fact that some passion can be negative, you must understand that you cannot achieve anything without passion. You cannot achieve anything if you don't have passion. My grandson, I've been kind of mentioning it, they just took him. And uh, he's heading to Michigan, uh, and he's got a little stopover between, uh, but he's going to be in Michigan in about a week here. And uh, he's starting his training, and he's put in for Navy SEAL school. And so uh, he's now moving in that direction. And I'm praying for him, and I'm praying that he gets it. And uh, we need guys like that. And, uh, uh, but you're talking about he was 100 pounds overweight. When he went to the recruiting office, the guy said, get out of here. I don't see you. Go away. You're not serious. You're serious? Lose 100 pounds and come back. He lost 100 pounds. He put on a suit. <laughs> He's got muscles on his muscles. He's not got just a few abs. He's got the whole washboard. And... Uh, and he's serious, a smart kid, smarter. He can learn languages, just boom, boom, boom. This kid has got it. And so we need people like that. But he's so passionate. Him and his mom went walking the other day, and they took a jog together. And he was just, you know, he's just so passionate right now. It's just amazing. But he's been that way for now a, a good long time as he's prepared to get himself ready for this. Uh, because it's something he's wanted to do. My, my son, my two sons, have been passionate about what they do, and today they're very successful in what they do because they, they don't just do it. It's not just a job. They're not just trying to get by. It's not about money. It's a, my daughter doesn't make a lot of money, but she is passionate. She has a contract with the state Uh, a private contractor to work with kids that are in public school systems that are struggling and can't make it. 
and she's under a private contract for that, and she, you know, she has uh, all that working for her, and she has her master's and all that, and she could go run a school. She's got all that background. She's got everything. She went to college to, you know, for that and all that kind of stuff, but she don't care about that. But John Hopkins gave my daughter 10 little boys who all had AIDS when they were born. And their mothers were drug addicts. And they gave them, they talked to her and brought her in and said, we want you to take care of these 10 kids. Now, they stayed at Hopkins, but every day she took them places. She did things with them. She was their group caretaker because with having AIDS, they had to have one person who knew every single phase of everything. And I think two of them, it was, died in her process. And, uh, but that's... That's just who she is. She's so passionate about it. She'll start talking and she'll mention kids in the school and she'll just start crying. And you see, when you're not passionate about something, you can, if you're not passionate about souls, then you can watch people. I was in New York years ago with a bunch of preachers and we were walking down the main road there in New York, you know, what's it called? The, the big one. And uh, with all the screens and all that. And, and there were, was a dead guy, a uh, homeless guy, and, and all the workers, I mean, I'm talking hundreds this way and hundreds that way, just walking, and they just stepped right over him. And, and I, I didn't do that. I couldn't do that. I just turned around, and, and the guys with me said, look, uh, they'll come get him, but, but you, you can't do nothing. And I just stood there a minute, backed away from it, and watched, and people, do, you know, he doesn't exist. And I just, oh, man, I just said, help, Lord. When people become that desensitized, and we live in a culture of that, especially uh, uh, the Z generation, they, they're, not, they're not very passionate about the right things. You getting any of this? If you discover the passion behind a man's success, you will have found the key that unlocks the door to his dream world. When you find his dream, you will discover his heart. And when you find his heart, you'll understand his actions. A lot of people are misunderstood because they're passionate. And uh, his passion, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, 423, talks about it. The, the heavenly kingdom collides with the religious systems of this world. And uh, Luke 17, 20 uh, defines it again. And then I gave you this, and I'm shifting from this to uh, tonight for just a few minutes. Uh, the kingdom of God is come when the will of God is done. Yes. Now that was, I picked up, there's a multitude of clearly defined passions that Jesus displayed while he was here on the earth. If you just take the time, my daughter said she's reading the book of Luke right now, and, and she's been reading through the whole Bible again, and she is, it was, we were in dialogue today about it, and she was asking questions, and we're working on some things. And the kingdom of God has come when the will of God is done. This is one of those primary passions was the king. Jesus said, I've come to preach the kingdom. Yeah. And we got to get that down because we think he came to preach about uh, uh, healing, or we think he came to preach about uh, you know, economics or some other things. And yet, uh, throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, there's uh, 1,400 scriptures about money and giving and one about being born again. So if you take 1,400 scriptures and figure out why did he say one time how important it was, is because everybody was interested in money and, 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 and God always hides things, so you have to seek him. Now, John 5, 19, well, I'm sorry, Matthew 6, 10. Uh, let's look at a couple of these scriptures, and then I'm going to go right by this because we already went over this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you know that was his prayer? Matthew 7, 21, that was his prayer. That was what he uh, said, thy kingdom come. Everything is connected to the kingdom is connected to his will. Remember I said the kingdom of God is come when the will of God is done. 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall come uh, enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Doing the will of God is the evidence of your understanding that the kingdom of God is God's primary. It's not a subpar. It's not an additional piece. It is primary. And, and churches in America, churches around the world, uh, up until maybe even the last 30 years, did not preach the kingdom. Most of you that went to another church, you came out of that church and they did not preach the kingdom. We have a peace for the city meeting and 50% of the pastors there never heard the message of the kingdom. See, when you preach the kingdom, you're entering into the fact that you have to do the will of God to really preach the truth of the kingdom. And I'm not sure I want to do the will of God I just want to talk about God. And that's where the church is rocking right now because people are having to decide, are you going to do the will of God or are you just going to go and hear sermons, sermonettes by, and become a missionette and, and whatever. And next thing you know, you're just, you're just going along with this process, blind leading the blind and everybody falls in the ditch. You understand? What got me and would have never held me, if you know me today, if you're in this church and long enough you know me, uh, I, I'm, I'm no average cat. And so uh, when I came in, if that Pastor Jimenez and his wife were not passionate, I'm gone. Because everybody I hung out with were drug dealers. And they were drug addicts, and they, I, was, I was dropping drugs off at night, and, 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 and masses of drugs were being sold, drugs in the tires of cars, drugs coming out of Mexico, uh, had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars everywhere, and it didn't matter because we were passionate when we surf, we surf waves this big and, and just take off on that wave at 40 miles an hour. You had to be passionate. And so if I went to church and they were like, oh, well. If you'd like to possibly consider, maybe, if you think it's all right and if you don't mind, if it works for you and everything fits in, if you don't mind doing that, maybe you could show up, in, if it's, unless you're busy. I'm gone. Let me hear. What attracts you to sports? What attracts you to some television show? You like the character, the singers that you like. You like their character because their character, one thing that's consistent, they are red hot about what they do. Even if they're idiots. You can be passionate about the wrong thing. John 5, 19, uh, he said, Jesus said he, does, he, sees what, he does what he sees the Father do. John 8, uh, 28, does what he sees the Father do again. John 5, 30, uh, I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The mysteries of the kingdom are locked away in the hidden places. God hides truth, so we have to seek him. See, seeking him forces you to seek his will. So he hides things so that you can't find them, but he, he makes it so that it's so attractive and so, you know, important that you just, you, you don't know what to do. You got you to gotta get a hold of it. And that's where hunger comes, and that hunger turns into passion. When you discover passion, you've had to work for it. Passion is not something I can give you. You have to take the truth of God's word and let it work in faith to your own life and then you have to decide, I'm gonna become passionate about that. I want that truth in my life. Keith Johnson all the time, I'm talking to him and he deals with all this uh, you know, confidence and he deals with all these kind of things and, and he'll tell you that you have to look at things in your life and say, I want that. If you see some Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. 
okay? So if you see something in somebody, you would say, I want that in my life. If you do, then you have to have the same passion that they did to get what they got. I've told my children always when they were little guys, I said, guys, don't you ever desire the money that I might make, but you desire how I got it. Are you there? Okay, the kingdom of God uh, is in direct conflict with Satan and his influence. And uh, so uh, Jesus even said in Matthew 12, 28, but if I cast out demons in the spirit of God, then, these, uh, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now, I ended with this, uh, John 17, 26, New King James. We can see G, uh, Jesus' passion to reveal the Father's love, to transfer it into each of us. His passion was Christ. Uh, in you, the hope of glory. That was the first scripture we talked about, right? When we started this. So that's where this was. He wanted Christ, wanted to become uh, attached, part of, in your life. So when people see you, they see Jesus. You understand? And so we see that the passion of the kingdom, now I'm going to talk to you about this part. The passion of the Father resulted in him giving his son for the man he created. Now think, I'm going to just read a little bit of my notes here to you so that I can get this done and get through it, but I want you to hear this. Kingdom of God is the philosophy, is the overarching uh, 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 truth that God the Father wanted his people to know. He did not come to save the lost. He, John says he came to get that which was lost. That, T-H-A-T, of uh, that is an object, is a system. Yeah. He did not come to get sinners. He came to give that which was lost, which was lost in the garden, which was God the Father working directly with the Son and, and the Son having dominion and the rule of God and the will of God operating in Adam's everyday life. That was what got lost, and that was given to Satan. Jesus went down, got the keys, uh, the kingdom of, uh, of death, hell, and all that, grave, and he came, and he gave it to the church. And the church has been advocating giving it back to the devil ever since. Because we realize that when we opened the door, the door required work. So we want a free ride. So we don't want to really, you know, don't, don't, don't test me. Don't, don't press me. I, I, I don't need any more pressure. <laughs> now, <laughs> so passion of God the Father resulted in him giving his son for the man that he created. The man, Adam, he gave his son. We know that story. The entrance of sin while disruptive and, in, and disrupting his plan, did not defeat it. Sin was in the midst of this because every man's born a sinner, and it didn't disrupt or it didn't defeat the plan the Father had because watch how it unfolds. God was committed to this being that he had created, that he had created. He let it be known to the principalities and powers that he himself would at the predetermined time intervene and secure this being from the destruction he had unleashed on the earth. So God the Father let Lucifer and all the fallen angels, all the principalities and powers, he let them know that it's like Job, you can touch everything that they have, but you can't take their life. I got that. And so all of a sudden, uh, the, the, all of hell has had to work with the constraint that God was going to keep covenant people in his hand. Israel and the redeemed. You and I. Okay? Now watch. He would not in disappointment 
and anger wipe his very memory from the slate of eternity. Instead, he would give up a part of himself as an, a, 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 as an example uh, uh, for their, that sin, which had to be satisfied. And you know, the wrath of God, when God brings out his judgment, is always got to be sas- satisfied. Blood was the only thing that would satisfy God's anger against sin. That's why when we see that bridge fall, and I made the statement to you that there is a gap now, there's a bridge that's down, and and it's fallen. How many of you hear that? The bridge has fallen. It's a symbol. It's a picture of how man has collapsed from its bridging God back to the earth as a nation. Are you hearing? Now, he would give up part of himself as an example for that sin. Part of himself was his son, which had to be satisfied. He would step out of the uh, shroud of mystery that obscured him from man and unveil himself to the world in the person of his son. God wanted to be seen. He wanted to be, but God's too powerful. If God showed up right now, he would melt you. Honestly, you couldn't couldn't handle the radiation of God. If, If all of the eternal that is eternity, its oxygen is God, how powerful is he? If he's always been God, how powerful is he? If the sun that we see is so hot was in his hand at one time and he flung it out there. Read, it says that. The sun that burns everything near it, it was in his hand and he slung it out there. So if God came and just got close to Sarah, zip, vapor. Do you understand? So he in his infinite, he gave his son who was him. He put part of his son, his his father, son, Holy Ghost. It's part of his nature. It was God coming on the earth. He wanted to be here. So he sent his son. Why? Because he really likes what he made. He likes man. He likes man. He wanted a man and he wanted to have a man that he could talk to, walk with. He tried it. He wants by the Holy Ghost to walk with you every day. So you live by the Spirit. You walk in the Spirit. You do not fulfill the lust of the flesh, but you walk by the Spirit. So he said, I want to walk with my people. I'm omnipotent. I can be in every one of them at one time. I'm omniscient. Uh, I know everything. I'm all, uh, 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 you know, what do you call it? Omnipotent. I mean, omnipotent. Thank you. He's all things, all the time, knows everything. He can be everywhere. He just said, I want to walk in my people. Now, that's his passion. His message was the kingdom. Now we're down into the fact, his love, his passion is how do I get in How do I get in (laughs) to that human? I want to get close. I don't want to be out here. The Old Testament, they were out here. So he says, I got to get in there. Okay, I got it. I'm going to send the Holy Ghost. When they opened their mouth, Jesus already did this. He breathed on the disciples. (sighs) He said, Panuma's coming. (sighs) And when he blew, the Holy Ghost said, oh, right, right on in there. Why? Because the DNA of the Father was on the breath of Jesus, and it rode right into those disciples, and they breathed in the DNA of God. Oh, I wish I could preach. Help me, Lord. John 3, 16 tells us that because of the great love the Father had for his creation, Now watch this. He sent his beloved son. The mission to earth was launched from the platform of heaven. 
So everything that God did, he pre-thought it in heaven. So the very essence of what God thought when he spoke it came out of heaven. That means it carries with it all things that pertain to the glory of God. The mission to earth was launched from the platform of heaven. Jesus entered the human race, consumed with the zeal of his father and with the fire of that love blazing in every fiber of his being. You had the first transplant of this, John the Baptist. He was a man that was possessed. He was on fire. He was wild looking. He had bees around his beard, honey dripping off of him. And he was just wild. And they would say, John the Baptist, I mean, and he said, I'm not worthy to undo his sandals. I'm nobody. I'm just a forerunner for the one that's coming is so much greater than, than, than what's me. But he had, he had that living passion. Come on. Paul, the apostle, didn't get his eyes opened and come out in apologetics. Oh, my God. Well, look, he was that way before he got converted he was that way before he got converted some of you will never do anything in the kingdom because you can't let go of this fact that that you you don't want to be pushed you you rather just you know And life is passing you by. Life is passing you by. Young people will get old that quick because they're waiting. Oh, yeah. Now, he was tireless. Oh, don't use that language. Oh, my God. He was tireless in his pursuit of bringing purpose and power to the people, uh, uh, hope uh, to the hopeless and healing to the sick and inheritance to the disheartened and acceptance to the rejected. His strategy was to empower the company of the disenfranchised and bring down the uh, uh, apprehensive uh, religious order of the day. So the depth of Jesus' love for the poor and needy originated from the throne. Let me ask you something. Uh, Gates of the throne are made out of pearls. Roads are made out of gold. Okay, just a couple items. Can can you imagine your God? You can speak anything you want. You want a sun? There it is. (laughs) What's a moon? I don't know. I think a moon, and so put a moon. Oh, let's get some stars. And he's there on the throne, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and he's thinking about the poor. How far down does God have to go to think about the poor when he can take his hand in Job and create the rivers and the mountains and the oceans. He just scooped them out with his hand. Atlantic Ocean, let's just make it. Even just, there's some dirt there and there. We'll make some mountains, the Rocky Mountains over here. Just, and he sits on the throne and goes, the poor, the disenfranchised. The disheartened, the disappointed. <laughs> and as some of you say, I never thought that God thought like that. <laughs> the depth of Jesus' love for the poor and needy originated from the throne. His heart for the poor and powerless 
extended all the way back to the establishment of the Jewish nation when his father instituted protective laws for the poor and the unfortunate in its midst. Think about, if you go to Deuteronomy and you read Deuteronomy and you go read Leviticus, God, in his ability to see the beginning from the end, he sees the beginning from the end. So he sees Israel. Yeshua, he sends the Savior. He hides them from the Jew. Because if he doesn't, the Jew will think they made him. So he has to hide him and make him a mystery. That's why that scripture, the guards that paid all, got all that money for keeping it quiet that Jesus rose from the dead, that's a big story. Exodus 22, 25. I'm going to give you a few scriptures here and, uh, and then get us a little deeper. I don't think I can finish. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, Exodus 20. Those back there, please push your fingers faster. If you, lead, if you lend money to any of the people who are poor among you, you shall not be like a money lender to him. You shall not charge him interest. Now, look at this. This is God talking. So God had to not see where he was, but see where we are. How low did he have to come? <laughs> There's an angel walking around. He's got fire in his hand. Okay. You got to keep reminding yourself, heaven is not going to be full of tulips and a bunch of little naked babies with wings just going, you know, and with arrows and, you know, and little hearts flying off them, you know, wee, ping, oh, ping, oh. And everybody's going to walk around going, oh, oh, I just, I just love. You didn't come to an altar and have somebody give you a uniform and tell you you're going to die, and then tell you when you die, you can't even be at peace because you're coming back, and he's coming on a horse, and you're coming back to do war. What the heck are you trying to create in your halluc hallucination of heaven so you're, everybody's skipping along, and, and you know, 400-pound football player men are tipping along. Woo! Lending money to the poor. Don't make yourself a money lender. Don't charge interest. Who came up with that? God invented the money system. God invented through the Bible everything we know. Navigational things came out of the Bible. Deuteronomy 15.4. However, there shall be no poor among you. <laughs> except that there may be no poor among you, for the Lord will greatly bless you in the land which the Lord your God has given to you to possess as an inheritance. Hello? Only if you carefully obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe with care all those commandments, do his will, which I command you today. So it says if you do everything you're supposed to do, ain't nobody going to be poor. Wonder why there's so many poor people in the church. You can owe me your amen. You ask yourself the question. That scripture said that Israel, if they obeyed the commandments of the Lord, that God would give an inheritance, they'd have land, and there would be nobody poor amongst them. But the part about keeping the commandments is that thing about doing the will. We don't want to do the will of God. We're selfish. Hello? If we would start doing the will of God, giving like we should, tithing like we should, doing all those aspects, there's no way that you can fail. It's fail-proof. 
because God is who he says he is. He's not a man that he could lie. It doesn't mean you're going to be so wealthy you can buy 15 new cars. He'll meet all your needs. Not all your wants. Now, 1 Samuel 2.8 talks about the restoration of the poor. 1 Samuel 2.8. Oh, come on, come on, come on. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among the princes. Look at this now. He takes the poor, raises them up, sets them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. There shouldn't be a church in Baltimore City that's living under a poverty spirit and has the same Bible, but they're not preaching the kingdom, which you have to do as will. Wow. And that's why when you, when you lock in and you're doing his will, zeal automatically comes Righteousness comes. You begin to live different, think different. Everything's possible. You're not walking around in a stupor of confusion and in awkward. My wife was saying something to me the other day, and, and, and we were talking about a situation, and sometimes there are people that are so awkward in who they are. They make everybody uncomfortable. If somebody comes to you and says, um, hi, uh, um, uh, you know, um, well, I don't know. You're going, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and people that, people that are so self-evaluating and they're so engrossed on self, they never get comfortable with who they are because they're not doing his will. When you do his will, you don't have to please nobody. Excuse me. I don't have to please nobody. I do his will. Now, if I get out of that, I, I've got a lot of problems I've got to deal with at that point. But if I'm here to do the will of my father, then I don't have to apologize. I don't have to live that way. But it makes me live holy. I can't go sleeping around. I can't go drugging. I can't go all that because, uh, you know, it, it keeps me in his will. There's no room for that. So restoration of the poor. He's going to give you, you know, set amongst princes. You're going to speak. The poor people are going to come on, saints. Have you say, I am going to turn in my poor man's card. I'm getting out of the union. I'm not going to join that union any longer. I'm turning in my card. You know, everything, you go to the store, you got to have a card to get to, you know, groceries and all that. Okay, I'm turning in my car of poverty. I'm not going to be under that anymore. <laughs> Job 34, 28, the cry of the poor came up to him. Uh, Psalm 72, verse 13. He will have compassion on the poor and the needy and live in and, and the lives of the needy he will save. The lives of the needy he will save. Listen to me, good. The reason Rock City Church is 40 years old and never dropped when others quit, others have blown up, others have had splits, others have had all kinds of garbage. The reason is because we take care of the poor. We translate them into the kingdom and they don't have to be there anymore. You're a friend of the poor, you're a friend of God. Psalm 140, three major revivals happened in the 90s, Brownsville, uh, Toronto and Baltimore. Toronto and, and Brownsville, they're disseminated. They're gone. Even the church uh, down in Brownsville, uh, lightning hit it, blew the whole, the whole roof off. They had to spend $350,000 to fix it. Uh, the Bible school there is a mess. Uh, uh, Bra uh, Toronto closed, new pastor, everything changed. Here we are, still going along because we're not trying to create moments 
We're trying to create relationship. I don't want a visitation. I want habitation. I don't want God to visit me. Hello? Uh, Psalm 140, verse 12. The Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the justice for the poor. Proverbs 19, 17. He who is gracious to the poor uh, a man lends to the Lord. Zechariah 7, 10. Do not oppress the poor. Matthew 9, 36, NIV. If they can even catch up to that. Uh, Matthew 9, 36, NIV. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Look at this. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Are you hearing me? Now, people think it was 5,000. You have to do the math correctly and know Jewish. Everybody that was a Jew was, was guaranteed to have three to four children, every one of them. All right, multiply that. And that was only talking about men, 5,000 men. Now you got to have a wife. So you got 10,000. So it ends up being around 25,000 that they fed with two loaves and two fishes. You understand that? Now, the key is, when you look at this, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Stop. That's not those that were there that were hungry. The disciples brought up, we can't handle this because here's the natural man. Here's the carnal man. We can't do this. We can't send them home. There's nowhere to go. There's no uh, uh, wise grocery store on the way back. There's no 7-Eleven open. So we can't send them. And, and so Jesus said, you feed them. That's what your Bible says. Jesus, when they started acting carnal, he said, okay, you got all kinds of power. Go ahead and feed them. Are you listening? But when they realized they couldn't, then somebody had enough faith to bring a little kid. And he brought him up to him and said, I know this is crazy, but here's a kid with a, he's got fish and chips and he's got it right here. He's been to McDonald's and they got a nice little fish sandwich and he, okay, he's got a, what do you call that little thing they give for kids? Uh, here's a happy boy with a happy meal. Uh, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because he didn't see them through the carnal eyes that the other guys saw them. He saw them harassed, helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Man shall not live by bread alone. He's not interested in your finding a place to eat. He's interested, are you hungry for him? He's not interested that you, that you break out of church like, like you know, you're going to starve to death because church is over. Well, let's go quick. <laughs> and you go in and invade a restaurant because you don't eat, you're going to die. Jesus looks at this crowd and he says, oh, oh my God, they're like sheep. Without a shepherd. There you're talking about passion. See, the disciples didn't have passion. He had passion. Well, they fed them. No, they didn't. He did. Just to appease them. If he could make that boy's uh, fish and chips work, Jesus just could have said, Lord, you haven't done it in a long time, but I know it's still there. Uh, tell the angel, you know, the little short one over the, yeah, the little chubby one there? Yeah. Tell him to drop some of that stuff called what is it? Manna. No, I, that's what it's called. Some of you are going, oh, he don't know. He can't think. <laughs> I was asking you a question. What is it is what it's called. Golly. Oh, we're going to help the poor pastor. He can't remember. He's getting so old. God help you. <laughs> Look at this. Matthew 15, 32, NIV. Jesus called the disciples to himself and said, I have compassion for these people. 
Look at this. What was his heart? His compassion was, he, he brought it up. He wanted them to have a shepherd. He, he is the chief shepherd. He wanted them to have somebody guide them, lead them, direct them, pastor them, help them. Compassion is often expressed through the human touch. So when we see compassion, many times it, it's demonstrated through touch. So he, Jesus wanted them to have somebody that would love them. Think about that. He didn't care about them eating. He cared about them having somebody that would say, no, 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 don't go that way. Go this way. Eat this grass. This is good for you. Matthew 8, 3 talks about, and I'm going to read just the scripture and tell you what they say. You don't have to put it on there because you're not going to catch up. Matthew 8, 3, he stretched out his hand and he touched them. Have you know all through, you remember the scripture says, Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. And he even illustrated to the doubters, he said, if I, if I by the finger of God drive out demons, surely the kingdom of God has come. Do you understand? Now, so he touched. How many of you understand that that's how important that is? It's the touch. It's the touch. Your hands transfer so much. Your hands do so much. Think about what your hands do to help you eat and to help you do everything, dress and drive and everything. Your hands are so important. And Jesus did some things with his hands. He got them in mud. He spit in it and put it on their eyes. He touched them. Think about it. What did he want to do with that crowd? He wanted them to have a shepherd. So when they were going along, bah, he could take, you know, come, 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 come here, come here. No, 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 no. Come along, come along, come along. If you go to Israel or any place like that, Egypt and all those places, you'll see shepherds. You go to, uh, you go to uh, uh, um, Ireland and you go to Scotland especially. Scotland has more sheep than it has. And, and if you go to uh, New Zealand, they have far more sheep than they have people. Oh, yeah, that's a fact. And you'll see these guys going along, and they got a stick, they got a dog, and they're just going along. And the sheep, and they're going along. And the cars have to slow down, and the sheep get over. And, psh, and every one of the sheep in Ireland are sprayed, and Scotland, are sprayed with a little uh, can of spray paint, a little spot. So if your sheep has a red spot on it, that's to your flock. If it has a blue spot on it, it means it belongs to them. That's how they separate the church. See, you've been spray painted. You didn't realize why you were worshiping. We went by and went, psst, psst. We sprayed you with a little spot. So when you show up, people say, mm-hmm, that's them rock church people. I can tell. They need to go back to Bishop's church. They, they need, I know where they came from. I know they got this funny look. They got this smell that's just like fragrance of flowers. I don't know what it is. Of course, it's the presence of God. And they understand. Matthew 9, 29, he touched their eyes. Have you know, Jesus just wants to touch you. Can you get close enough for him to touch you? Matthew 17, 7, he touched them and fear left. Wow. Matthew 20, 34, he touched their eyes. Luke 7, 14, he touched the young man's coffin and told him to rise up. Think how powerful transference of anointing is. What did Jesus want? He didn't really want you to touch, but he's walking down the street one day, crowd of people, and, and Jairus is trying to get Jesus to go home to his sick daughter. And this woman who's been sick for years, 12 years, 10 years, whatever, and she's got this issue of blood and she can't, she, she's just dying. It's just draining her out. 
and she crawls along the floor, all the legs and all the feet and all the shoving and pushing. No, I'm with him. No, you get back here. Good church people, you know. I'm, I'm here. I'm in. No, I'm with him. She's just crawling along. Ow, stepped on my hand. Okay. And she reaches up, and all she can get, he slowed down, and she touches the tassel. He had tassels on his garment. She touches the tassel of his garment. And Jesus stops and says, virtue just went out of me. That's why he wants to touch you. So virtue transfers. It's the transfer of the anointing. When you come to an altar and somebody's down to pray with you, there's, there's, a, hopefully, there's a transference of anointing. That's what he's after. That's one of the passions of your God. He wanted to get close enough to you that he could touch you. Think of that. Because he knew if he could. The reason Jesus spit was because all your DNA is in your mouth. And the most powerful place to pick up a person's DNA is to swab the mouth. God DNA is now coming. It's in my hand. And it goes on the eyes. And the man begins to see. He just wants to touch you. Are you still there? Oh. It's not possible. Luke. Six, uh, six, nineteen, and all the multitude were trying to touch him, for power was coming from him. Look at it says, and all the people tried to touch him. Because the people who broke the roof of that house, they they could have been like the centurion and just said, just speak the word, my servant will get healed. But you know, when you really are in a, a DNA transfer of need, you want him to touch you. That's why we worship. That's why we come to prayer meetings. That's why we, we put ourselves in front of him, that he might touch you. There were people that came to the play on Sunday and said to me and to others I've heard, there is some, uh, three ladies came to me. She said, I go to church, but there's something in this church. Uh, she said, I'm not, I'm coming back. <laughs> she said, I, I don't know if she will, but she said, I'm coming back. She said, I don't know what, there's something here. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, <laughs> you've been going to church for 50 years and you ain't been where he showed up. It's like the head inspector for the fire department was in here one day. And he's got his thing, his clipboard, and he's, he's looking. He is so confused. I said, what's wrong, Captain? I knew him, Captain Kelly. I said, Captain Kelly, what you, what's wrong? I don't know how I came in here. How did I get in here? <laughs> I, I knew what was happening. The music is back there playing. You know, Ashley is singing. We're worshiping in here. You can feel it. He, he says, uh, yeah. I, I just, show me how to get out. I, I'm, I just need to get to the door. <laughs> I opened the door and he ran. He goes, you're approved. <laughs> there are two means of measuring God's love. One is the cross. This is where I'll end tonight. There's two means of measuring God's love. One is the cross, 1 John 4, 8, and 10. Put it on the board, please. I'm going to give you seven blessings of holy passion, but I can't do it. So you have to go back. See, it just make you hungry. <laughs> but look at this. Whoever does not love does not know God. Okay, stop for a minute. My concept, your concept of love is nothing to do with God's love. You couldn't love 
an ant. You couldn't love a, a creature. You couldn't. Because you can't love till he which is love has touched you. Because now you ain't loving with your love. And see, his love is righteous judgment. Not sloppy agape, slippery mercy, where you're just trying to help everybody get by. Just help them get through. I know they got plagues and they got... They got everything all over them, but just get them in. His love don't do that. He says in Matthew, you did this in my name. You did that in my name. Depart from me. I don't even know you. I tell people all the time, very few people want Jesus to be their pastor. I mean, I've never called any of you the devil. I've thought it. No, I just. <laughs> Two means of measuring God's love, the cross right there. Whoever, uh, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. That's what he was trying to reveal. This is how God showed his love. So here's, the, he, he wanted to be passionate. So how did he show it? Among us, he sent his one and only son. There's not a second Adam. It's the last Adam. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That we might live through him. The life that I have, Paul said, I have to live is by the grace of God. And I live because he lives in me. Go on, verse 10. This is love. Not that we loved God. He's going to get it straight here now. See, because, you know, you got good, well-meaning Christians that are interfering with God trying to change the nations. Because they're trying to humanize God's love. And it don't look like human love. And you got churches that are massive. And every Sunday they preach about man's ability to love. See, I, I ran into the one who said I was his enemy, yet he still loved me. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He first loved us. Come on. I, I, somebody said to me one day, God's the best chess player in the world. It's always your move. The second one, and I'll finish there. The two measuring rods, one is his love, his love, too, is the gift of sonship. The gift of sonship is what God the Father was trying to present to us. He wanted us to see what love looked like. Back then, every man wanted a son. Not that they didn't want daughters, but they wanted a son because that was a sign, that was something to, to carry that you had raised a son. Even the pharaohs suffered when they couldn't find their own son. They, they would go get concubines and they'd have a polyphery of them and try to find one that would give them a son because that was the, the whole mantra of the time. Got to have a son. God said, I'll take my son and give him for them. And they know how rotten they are. But the second thing was the gift of sonship. 1 John 3, 1. 1 John 3, 1. I'm there. For those of you that your little alarm on your wrist is just bumping and jumping, saying, hurry up, hurry up, get out of here. It's 9 o'clock. 
fangs start dropping down. And... First John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished. That's a Song of Solomon type word. See what great love the Father have lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. God the Father adopted you and me as his children. He gave himself to us as our Father, made us fellow heirs with Jesus because he chose to, not because he had to. How do you hear that? You got brought into sonship, and that was the ultimate. You got the message is the kingdom, and then you have his love, which eclipses everything. And then you have sonship that now starts you on the inheritance of all things God. So now you can walk on the earth like God walked on the earth. Hello? Hello? The same power, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if it dwells in you, then it quickens your mortal body. So you have this, this power, not of yourself, but of the panuma of God, that when you walk on the earth, you're actually walking, and God is now got close as he could get, because he's closer than a brother, he's in you. He's inside of you. How he did that, I explained it. By the pneuma breath of God, the Holy Ghost, the particles of that came inside of you. When you breathed in, your lungs swelled up and said, Woo, that's a rush. I got something going on on the inside. And out of your belly began to flow a river. And out of your mouth began to speak languages and tongues. Uh, and heavenly thoughts began to roll. And you began to look at your hands. Uh, and fire was in your hands. Uh, and you laid hands on the sick. And the sick recovered. You went to demons and they ran away. And now you're walking around saying, how did he get inside of me? I don't want him to leave. I don't want him to leave. Stand on your feet. Because I'm about to leave. How many of you get any of this? Have you say, Lord, thank you. We're peeling the onion. We're pulling back things. We're causing us to get a picture. It's a picture story. It's a picture, biblical picture story that all of a sudden we're starting to look at Scripture and look at what's God, what God is trying to tell us. you got to have passion. Now let me help you at the end here. Don't confuse your personality trait with the fact that you can't have passion like somebody. Every person can have this, because this is not changing your personality. This is empowering you to live a radical, free life of your personal inhibitions and limitations that make you awkward in life and make you so that you can't really, you can't really succeed because you're stepping on your own feet. I, I did not do this for a living. I did not do this for a living when I got saved. I didn't like to stand in, up in front of a whole, well, because I was wanted. I didn't like to stand. Anyway, I didn't like to stand. Bad illustration. I didn't like to stand in front of a whole bunch of people. Okay. Somebody else is story. But anyway, I didn't like that. But then when I got a little nine-year-old boy, prayed for me to get the Holy Ghost. I was at a, uh, my dad built the place, downtown Virginia Beach. It's a conference center. It was called the Dome. It was a massive place. My dad built it. And it had a, a stage like about this high. And I was just like this, asking for the Holy Ghost to come on me. And all of a sudden, the power of God nailed me up against this thing. And I thought 
I, I saw the plugs. I thought I was being electrocuted. And at first, I, th- I thought, okay, I, I, I got to break away from this. I'm, I'm going to stand right here and die. This thing is, is shocking me. And as I was just breathing, I realized I was free. I could move away, so it wasn't that. And then it dawned on me, a little nine-year-old boy had his hand in my back, and he's speaking in tongues 100 miles an hour. And he says, give it to him. Give it to him, Jesus. Give it to him, all of it. Just light him up. (laughs) And every time he prayed, And, and, and I don't want to turn it off. But I want you to realize it's not your personality. Don't try to live under your personality and say, well, you know, I'm a quiet, I'm a timid person. Yeah, well, you ain't got the Holy Ghost. I guarantee you in that 120 that were up in that upper room, there were some boys doing a Texas jig that all of a sudden somebody said, my God. Look at Peter. I know what. He's drunk. They didn't know how to deal with Peter because he came out. He was preaching. You, you better. And they said, it ain't even the ninth hour and the boy's drunk already. Isn't the Bible good? Father, we thank you. We thank you. Lord, I ask tonight that you just refill Rebaptize, refill your people, God. Refill them with the Holy Ghost, God. God, let the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, let the power of the Spirit of God uh, wash over them, wash over them, renew their mind, renew them in every way. Oh, Rabande de de Bihia la Bokai. Oh, God, give a spirit of laughter. Give a spirit of joy. Let them have a spirit of anointing. To Arise, arise, arise. Oh, arise, arise. Let go, let go, let go, let God arise. Let God arise. Let your enemy be scattered. Let your enemy be scattered. Your enemy's your mind. Your enemy's your mind. Your mind is keeping you. Your mind is making you a prisoner of self. A prisoner of self, let go of the way you think and let God empower your brain. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family. Oh, yeah.
Come on. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Uh huh. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. Jesus. Oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. that the church is not dead, the church is not over with, the church age is not done with. They felt bold enough to go into uh, the Catholic Church up in New York and demonstrate on Resurrection Sunday. You know, they, 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 the world has just said the church is done, they're not even an instrument. Two things are gonna have to reveal through you, and that is the Father's love. Real love, real God love, not your sloppy agape, but real godly love, confrontational love even. And the second thing is that's really is this passionate zeal, this absolute aliveness in you. Some of you have taken on the nature of of a retirement mentality. You think you're, you're due to just kind of, and then I don't care what age you are, you still have that mentality. You think you somehow have been allowed to just kind of coast through. Here's what happens, my experience. God will just go around you and not use you. You'll feel like Samson. You'll say one morning, I didn't know the hand of God was off of me. Don't let the fire that in Israel's day was never allowed to go out. Don't let the fire go out. And it's the world that's trying to put it out. It's your cares of the world. 
It's the pressures of the world. You let that fire go out and it just is hard to get it relit again. I tell these Bible school students, they're going to have the fight of their life after May. Because they're going to go out of this incubator and they're going to all of a sudden be standing there and there's going to be nobody around pushing them. Come on, come on, get in prayer. Come on, get up, raise your hands. Come on, pay attention, don't fall asleep. And because of that, that's developed a new habit that they now see they can live a different life. I refuse. Apostle John Kelly called me uh, yesterday. We talked for a long time. And I told him some things about what was happening, different things. And uh, he said to me, he said, Bart, you, you keep things alive. He said, well, I love talking to you because you cause me to, to activate. And look, saints, I just refuse to just walk around like a grump and maybe tell people how proper I am, how dignified I am. I don't want to be a wart or an old frog that sits on a log. Come on. You need to look at somebody and say, stop croaking and start shouting. Come on, tell them. Stop croaking and start shouting. Yeah, that's right. You tell somebody. You look right at them. And tomorrow morning, you got to tell one person, that person that's in the mirror. You say to the person in the mirror, stop croaking and start shouting. Bring your best offering tonight. Your best. In the darkness over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you for watching with us here at Rock City Church. Call our prayer line at 410-882-2689. Join us in giving. Go to giver.cc 